Welcome to the Manufacturing and Engineering Week podcast. I'm Ed Tranter, Director of Manufacturing and Engineering Week, and I'm delighted to kick off 2022 with our first podcast guest, which is Libby Myrick, the Chief Executive Officer of the Institution of Engineering Designers, a big advocate of the show, a member of the advisory board, and I look forward to sharing all that we talked about. So Libby, thank you so much for joining us on the Manufacturing and Engineering Week podcast. We are delighted to have you on. You're very welcome. Thank you very much for asking me. It's a well, thrill to be here. <laughs> I'm sure it is. Thank you. So um, Libby, we've, we were just saying actually, we've known each other now for the best part of eight years. It's been a long time since first discussing um, design engineering and everything that goes within that. Um, and obviously, we're thrilled to have you as a member of the advisory board for m and &E Week with a particular focus on the design side. But um, for, for those people that are viewing and watching, and it'd be really great if you could tell us about what the IED is and what your role is within it and what it's, what it's here to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the IED is uh, not an improvised explosive device. It's the Institution of Engineering Designers, um, and we are a professional organization for people who work in engineering and product design. Um, so that means we are a, a membership body for individual designers, and we work through uh, the entire career span of people that work in engineering design. So we work with schools and colleges to promote engineering and design as a career. We work with universities, to look at the uh, content of the academic courses that they provide to students in the UK and overseas to make sure that uh, what they're teaching is relevant for industry, um, is applicable to current standards and um, is useful for the students uh, uh, on graduation. Um, and then we also work with um, individual engineers and designers throughout their career from graduation right through to registration um, and retirement in terms of uh, supporting them with um, uh, professional registration, training, continual professional development, um, uh, updates on recent legislation, um, information that's uh, current to any upskilling that's relevant for their work. Um, and then also the other support aspects such as help with professional indemnity insurance, um, guidance on whistleblowing, um, all the sort of support network that anybody who works in engineering and product design um, either needs in addition to what they get provided with within work or or because they might work for themselves and therefore they need a source of information and support. Um, so that's kind of the core of what we do as an organisation. We've been doing it for um, over 75 years now. So we're not a huge professional body, but we're not the smallest and we've been around for, for quite a long time. Um, and on top of that, we also work with um, industry and government on a wide range of topics. Um, just this morning, I was talking to um, a policy centre on, I'll just look at my notes here, um, range of topics we talked about this morning were things such as circular design and end of life, all linked into COP26 and sustainability issues, um, everything from um, transport and healthcare right through to the current issues that the, the engineering uh, society is currently working with government on, on uh, topics such as ventilation of buildings and safe working and safe transport for people in and under the current COVID pandemic. So um, yes, we're a relatively small organisation. I've been um, with the IED for its 25 years this year. Not all as CEO. Um, only 21 a CEO, um, but it's it's we're a really wide, diverse body. We're a very broad church of, of uh, professionals, um, and it's really exciting. It's a really it's a really great career, and it's a really um, interesting group of people that we work with. So, um, in a nutshell, that's the IED. That's a big nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> You're covering a lot of ground there, covering a lot of ground. Um, but what's it's interesting? Even when you were talking, then just the there's so much change happening in design at the design level of, of engineering. As we move, you know, as we had COP26 and we've talked about the circular economy, which you mentioned there. So it feels like sustainability is um, alongside skills and diversity, but sustainability is, is almost number one really for the design community on how to innovate in design, how to change the way that we use products 
whether it's from building roads and infrastructure right the way through to the small products that we buy and have and, and hold in our hands. So is that the big opportunity for UK design engineers? And if so, how does that work? And, and are there other opportunities that engineers can look at? Um, sustainability, without a doubt, is the core um, opportunity for the vast majority of, of, of engineers and designers in the UK. I, I, from the point of view from working with us and, and with our partners, um, and there's a huge range of, of topics that we get involved in as a professional body with um, our engineers um, representing us. And that's everything from British standards, uh, um, manufacturing, um, the, the design for manufacturer um, use and, disp and disposal, right through to um, charge environmentalist sustainability issues. Um, we're currently working on a project um, with academia in terms of how to integrate sustainability into teaching um, of, of design and engineering um, on academic courses. Um, and then, of course, as you say, there is all that sustainability and uh, protection of design for the environment is core to everything that designers do. Designers are responsible for um, material selection, um, processing, uh, manufacturing um, systems, um, labelling, packaging. Designers are, are involved in such... It's integral to every single part of the work that a designer does that the impact that designers and engineers can have on the environment as a whole is huge um, and it's something that's really close to, to my heart personally as, as an environmentalist um, and a sustainability champion for you know most of my life um, but it's also something that's becoming more and more prevalent within within um, engineering and design. And at our recent awards lunch that was held in October last year, um, our current president, Pete Lomas of Raspberry Pi, called upon our, our members to, to come together and to work together on, on ending the, um, the disposability, I suppose, of, of designed products. And of course, we're really excited about the, the legislation that's coming in in Europe in terms of make the right for repairability. And I think we've got an article about it in our, our latest journal about that, actually. Um, and again, that's the sort of project that we, we try to get behind, that we're supporting government with, and that we think that engineers and designers in particular um, are behind and increasingly are behind because younger people are really excited about, about sustainability and are really aware of the impact they can have um, on the planet and on, on, on resources. Um, some of the other issues that... Um, that you were that you asked about um our members are really um obviously we've got the the main topics again of diversity and inclusion how to increase uh the pool of people coming into into the the fields of engineering and design um and how to make sure that uh design itself is influenced by a more diverse um and inclusive audience in terms of you know we've all heard stories uh, of the nhs back a, a year ago with you know nurses saying that they couldn't get PPE equipment to fit because most PPE has been designed for a five foot 10 male. And actually, if you're a five foot two female, then you can't get a mask that fits your face or you can't get a gown that fits. And again, it, that promulgates throughout all design um, uh, disciplines really and, and how to make sure that that's rectified. Um, and then of course, we've also got the issues of uh, digital design, AI, um, the golden thread, all those sorts of things that are, uh, are still very important and obviously still need to be looked at and still need to be developed and worked on while the whole sustainability issue um, suddenly, we, it seems, has, has come to the fore and everybody suddenly realised that's something we really ought to be getting on with. <laughs> Slow and steady wins the race. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, you touched on it there as well. It's um, <clears throat> skills has been probably a topic of conversation that every time I've seen you in the last sort of eight years has been, we've probably spoken about. And it was yeah. spoken about for 20 years before that and 20 years before that. And it, it seems to be a continual struggle to attract enough young talent into the industry that can be then grown and developed into what we need. Um, mm. is, there, is there an approach that you have seen that works or that you feel or that the, the IED has been sort of actively supporting 
What what are the answers to that? Um, to be honest, I don't know. And I wish I did know what the golden bullet was because I've been involved in so many projects over so many years with so many different um, bodies. Um, and there's been an awful lot of money spent on this. Everything from the Big Bang Fairs to Tomorrow's Engineers to every single professional body that I know that has that works in engineering um, in terms of how do we encourage a wider group of young people to become engineers. Um, and some of it is working. As an, as an engineering institution or as a, as a professional body, we encourage and work with quite a lot of people that work with younger people at schools. Um, and when I first started working on projects as to how to encourage people to become engineers, the focus was on 15 year olds, you know, just about to do their GCSEs. And then that focus dropped to 11 because actually 15 is too late. Uh, young people have already chosen what they want or already have an idea of what they want of a, as a career. Um, and but increasingly, actually, it's gone from 11 to primary school because kids have got an innate desire to make stuff. Kids want to. Most children that I know want to make things. And whether that's sticking toilet rolls together to make a princess castle or whether that's playing around with Lego to make, you know, a, a rocket. Kids have a desire to make things and to work things out and to find out how things work. And somehow that, that gets squished and squashed out of them until when they get to 11 or 12, they're not quite sure what they want to do other than do something on YouTube, which, you know, I'm showing my age here, but actually, quite frankly, has no purpose for anything um, in terms of a career. Um, and I, I, so I think increasingly the projects that we're involved in as, as an organisation that we're supporting are aimed at younger people. Um, and again, it, we, we obviously we've got to talk about diversity and inclusion, because if we're only fishing from half the gene pool, we're never going to fill the skills shortage. Um, but an, another emerging field that's coming out in the work that we're doing is um, reskilling people, because the world of technology and design is changing so quickly that graduates are finding themselves in need of, of retraining and reskilling and upskilling only a few short years after graduation. And actually, how do we as an organisation support particularly individuals and SMEs who might not have the resources of some of the bigger companies to retrain and, and upskill their existing engineers and designers in new technologies, new legislation, new ways of doing things? Um, so it's, it's, yeah, I wish I did have the golden bullet, but I don't. And um, everybody's working away very hard in these areas. And um it might be a need for greater co coordination for more impact rather than small repeated projects, but that's a topic for another discussion, I'm sure. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I think that's the challenge, isn't it? I mean, because there's a lot of a lot of the big OEMs obviously do very successful programs, but then it's easy to attract everyone to turn up to Rolls Royce or BAE yeah. Systems. <clears throat> Maybe yeah. not so easy to attract them to to other other areas of engineering and manufacturing or other different types of firms within the supply chain. Yeah, and, and actually also um, some of the bigger, you know, huger, well-known engineering and design organisations or companies and employers have their almost their pet schools that they always go to. So actually they're preaching to the converted. They know that a certain school will produce a certain number of physics A-level graduates, uh, physics A-levels, and therefore it's it's quite an easy push to consider encouraging those children into engineering as a career. Whereas actually there are quite a few schools who are in, um, shall we say, less well-off areas who have different socioeconomic background and different demographics who have no interaction and no contact at all with any such programmes. And if you can imagine the talent that could be there, that could be tapped into, um, but it's going to take an effort to get to them and it's going to take a... Um, and, and actually, um, yeah, Engineering UK under their um, Tomorrow's Engineers banner um, do a really, really good job of, of uh, measuring data from schools and helping companies identify schools that actually have no representation and no contact at all. So if anybody's listening and they want to know they have a project and they're not quite sure where to go, contact Engineering UK via Tomorrow's Engineers and they will put you in touch with schools who will literally bite your hand off to run your project for you. Amazing, good advice. So make sure you do. If you if you if you've got a project, please do reach out. 
and we can post something in the uh, messaging below or possibly have something running over the screen as it as it comes live with a link to tomorrow's engineers um, <clears throat> you've as you've said yourself 21 years as CEO of the IED you've got such a great kind of um, crow's nest view of so much exciting stuff that happens across all aspects of engineering design and product design so in all of those years have there been have there been a, f a few moments of things that you've seen where you've just gone wow that was cool and it's really stuck with you either than because you saw it at the time and what it's then become or mm. or just generally being something really really cool um yeah, and I've been I've been really lucky actually. Um, obviously, not so much in recent years, but I have been really lucky, especially early on in my career, that I got to travel around um, universities and various industries, looking at the stuff that people were making. Um, and it's I can tell tell how long I've been doing this. In my very early days, it was kind of greasy sheds that um, that were full of mechanics, and there wasn't a ladies' loo. Why are you even asking? through to, you know, current, re re relatively recent visits to places like Surrey Satellite Technologies, where they are building spaceships and everything's white and pristine and, you know, brilliantly lit like a sci-fi movie. And you just think, and everything, everything seems to be made from foil, which is quite astounding. You think, how does that um, end up in space? Um, but two, two personal favourites of mine was sitting at a lunch, and this, this basically reflects how... Um, self-effacing engineers are sitting at lunch next to a chap who was the guy that invented the needleless injection and from a personal point of view somebody who was absolutely terrified of needles growing up I'm, I'm fine now but I did say to him that is really really cool and being a typical engineer just went yeah it's all right it's my job which to be <laughs> honest I over 25 years I've still not got used to the fact that engineers and designers are these people that do amazingly wonderful fantastic life-saving planet-saving projects and they just go yeah it's my job it's fine yes it is your job but please shout about it tell everybody because it's amazing and wonderful and really cool um and then the 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 other really really cool thing and this is going to sound so geeky was actually sitting in a car that that drove itself and parked itself just from from wow this is the future and obviously this was six seven years ago um at ford um, with Graham Hoare, who is an honorary fellow of the institution. I don't think he works for Ford anymore. Um, but he, they were doing test drives and he said, do you want to sit? And so I sat in a you know, Ford Fiesta and pressed a button and the car drove itself and off it went. And it, I didn't, drove along a line of parked cars and it identified a space that was just about big enough for it to get in. And I pressed another button and off it went and the steering wheel moved and, you know, it was, and it was, I, uh, the, that it kind of gave me confidence in autonomous vehicles because I thought actually that that is really quite cool in terms of the stuff that engineers do so um yeah and you know talk, talking to talking to our members who design everything from lifeboats to motorway gantries to um, mobile phones talking to them about their careers in engineering and what they find um most satisfying is without without a doubt every single one says seeing my stuff being used it's really cool that i've designed that and somebody's using it for the purpose that i designed it for and it gives me a little warm feeling inside and i think i think that's just that's just great no it's very cool good examples so i think <clears throat> i think you're right though you've touched on a thing there as you were describing it it's often felt like um manufacturing and engineering across the board not just within design but across the board um in terms of public perception of where you put your children for a career it's lacked yeah. the rock star you know we don't seem to have that rock star thing because of the fact that um as you say for the most part most engineers sort of do what they do and they do it because they've done it and that's all the accolade they need so actually mm. You haven't got a be like them or be like them. I mean, you had, I guess, on product design, you had Johnny Ives at Apple, mm. um, and I and, and and the closest you've got really to an extent, I guess, is like an Elon Musk, in that he, I mean, don't always want to follow exactly as where <laughs> Elon goes, yeah. but at least he is um, 
he's proper rock star throw your tv out the, out the window but it's all right because i've made it 100 percent biodegradable and sustainable and it'll, it'll rebuild yeah. itself type of thing but do you think it's those people that have a responsibility as well to actually lead the charge and the call for for just coming to engineering it's really cool yeah and i think i think there is there is absolutely 100 percent an image problem with engineering as a career because people think it's either going to be really geeky and nerdy and really difficult maths and that's not for me or it's going to be um oily rag spanner that hard hats that's not for me i have banned the use of uh, images with hard hats and spanners in any publication that we do because that's definitely not what our members do um, and I think also um, engineers are kind of almost a victim of their own success because everything works so well and everything is designed so well that people forget that they're designed by people that general consumers forget that everything that you have has been designed by someone. Someone's designed, somebody's decided what that's going to be made of, out of and how it's going to be made and how it's going to be put together and how it's going to be transported and what packaging it's going to be sold in. But we just see it and we say, that's really cool. That's really useful. That fits into the cup holder in my car. Um, I'm going to buy one of those. And you don't think about who's designed it and who's made it and who's made all those decisions. And one of my favourite conversations I have with, with small people um, school children is name me something that isn't designed and the closest we've ever had is water you know I had a six-year-old say to me well water's not designed by anybody I said well no water's not but the stinky smelly stuff that's full of pondweed that's in your garden you know the stream at the end of your garden isn't what comes out of your tap so various people along the line have collected that water and filtered it and put it in a pipe and designed the tap that you turn on and it comes out. So all these engineers and all these designers have been involved in all these processes. And I think that's partly the problem. Until things go wrong, nobody really thinks about the engineers and the designers. And it's almost like we need some kind of celebration of just the boring, bland stuff that engineers do, but that actually we wouldn't be able to live without. And whether that's MRI scanners or whether that's trainers or a water bottle or a tap, yeah, that's basically, you know, that's that's what needed, I think, that for appreciation of that these things, as I quite often say to people, it's not the pixies that do it. You know, real people do this and it's and it's their job. And you could do it too. Because actually, if you don't like it, you could make it a different colour or a different size or a different shape or out of a different material. If you've got a really good idea, let us know, you know, because that's how design works and that's how engineering works on a really yeah. simplistic level, obviously. I watched um, the children have a, a, a favourite movie from back in the day that I still watch regularly, which is Robots. And mm. there's uh, this character, Big Weld, in it, and his thing was see a need, fill a need, and then he would go out and make it. And <clears throat> I always used to think that was the perfect example of, of diluted all the way down to, to what engineering and engineering design is all about, see a need and fill yeah. a need. So, and, that, and that's why I think the issues of sustainability are really key to, to pulling people and younger people into engineering and design, because that's the only way out of the climate crisis. It's not, well, it's not the only way. Obviously, we all need to consume less. We all need to use less. Um, but the, the key other side to that coin is, is actually uh, using stuff that has been designed properly and that can be reused and that can be recycled and that can be disposed of safely. Um, and, uh, and and also different ways of doing things and different ways of travel and different ways of communicating. Um, and that's, again, that's engineering design, that's manufacturing, that's, you know, that's a solution. And quite a few younger people that we talk to at universities go into engineering design because they want to help save the world, which is a really grandiose idea, but somebody's got to do it. So quite frankly, why not engineers and designers? Absolutely right. Well, I think I could talk to you all afternoon <laughs> but I'm very conscious of your time and appreciate how much you've already given us. So Libby, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you for your support on the advisory board. And it's great to work in partnership with you and with the institution on this project. And um, we'll look for, well, we'll both look forward to seeing you at the NEC in June <laughs> of this year. So see you there. Yes. And thanks again, Libby. Thank you very much, Ed. Nice to see you.